Our speaker tonight, welcome everyone to the OAS February, uh, January uh, meeting for 2022. Uh, our speaker tonight, uh, we have two, Dr. Pat McCutcheon, anthropology professor at Central Washington University, and Nick Simmerdak, a student at the same university. Uh, the, to the topic of their uh, presentation will be chemical sourcing and technical analysis of volcanic glass lithics from the Grissom site. 45KT301. Please hold your questions uh, until the end of the talk, but what you can do is go to the chat room function, and if you have a question and it's a burning question, type it into the chat room, and at the end, uh, Paula Hale goes through there and sorts out the questions from the chat room, and so we can, we can ask those questions. Okay, take it away, Pat and Nick. Uh, all right, thank you. Um, so I'm Nick Simmerdak. Um, I'm currently a, a student at the Cultural and Environmental Resource Management Program at Central Washington University. Um, I also did my undergraduate here, and this is when I did the uh, bulk of this research. Um, Dr. McCutcheon, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. Again, it's, it's great to be here. Thank you for having us. Um, at Central Washington University, we're really lucky we have an undergraduate research scholarship that um, allows for uh, students to apply. It's a competitive scholarship and Nick was able to apply uh, to that scholarship and it funds archeology span that's done in the Kittitas Valley. It was set up, the Farrell Scholarship was set up years, decades and decades ago. And uh, we've done a bunch of archeology span um, research with undergrads here that way. and. This is something I've been doing for years with my students. It's a great opportunity. It pays their tuition and books and research costs. And so that's how we've accumulated quite a bit of information about this site, the Grissom site. Um, and I'll wait to introduce the site later in the presentation. But uh, I've been doing archaeology in the Pacific Northwest for a very long time. Um, I did my field school in 1984. And I've taught about 26 field schools. And I agree with Jim Kaiser that that training program you guys have is really very hot, top, hot commodity there. I, uh, I'm uh, quite jealous of it and I hope to learn some stuff from it. So that's, that's really great. Thank you for having us. Awesome. Um, so yeah, so this presentation is going to be about uh, the process and results of uh, chemical sourcing on volcanic glass. Um, out of uh, the 45KT301 site, also known as the Grissom site. Um, I wanted to start with a couple of acknowledgements, what Dr. McCutcheon was talking about, the Seaferl Fine Arts and Research Scholarship. Um, not only funded my research, but the research of several students as he talked about, and um, really the bulk of this data is just because they funded it. Um, also Northwest Research of City and Studies Laboratory because they did the chemical sourcing on both my samples and the samples of a previous student. Um, a couple of my professors, Dr. Lubinsky, Dr. Hackenberger, and Dr. Terry, um, who were all critical to my ability to do this research, especially Dr. Lubinsky with accessing and managing this collection. Um, and then also the past students for the work that they've done, I would not be able to do this research without all of that cumulative effort. Um, and then also the immense support from my friends, my partner. I was in the lab really late some days, um, doing a lot of counting and a lot of looking at rocks. Um, so to give us a context of sort of where we're looking, um, we're looking in the Kittitas Valley, uh, sort of highlighted here in pink. The Grissom site specifically is sort of on the edge of that, um, as you can see here by the red dot. Um, and to sort of get a sense for where this is in terms of uh, uh, trade and movement around the Pacific Northwest, um, I want to turn our attention to uh, this map from Swaggerty. Um, this represents only a small portion of the actual occupational history of the site. Um, but if we take a closer look, uh, right in the middle is this little triangle that's labeled as Kittitas Fair, and that's roughly the same location as the Grissom site. So we can get a sense for uh, where it is in terms of um, trade and movement in this area and see the connections that it has to a bunch of other um, sort of places on the landscape and, and other people and other uh, materials. Um, so to get into uh, sort of what this site is, um, we can see a picture uh, from 1970 of the uh, one of the excavation seasons. Um, Smithsonian number 45KT301. Um, 
It's situated on Kittitas, Yakima, and Colville traditional territory. It's primarily Kittitas, um, and the Kittitas were sort of folded in with the Yakima, Confederated Tribes of the Yakima in the 1855 um, treaty. Uh, this was first investigated for its potential connection to uh, an ethnographically recorded site known as Shalohan. Um, I will get into that a little bit later, but it's sort of beyond the purview of today's talk. Um, uh, excavations took place uh, during field schools run by Central Washington State College, currently CWU, between 1967 and 1971. Um, on the right here, we can see this is actually a picture of one of the units, JTW. Um, they're quite large units, and this is uh, ostensibly seemingly the largest in terms of the material that was removed. Um, the main excavation block is 58 two by two meter units. Um, so like I said, quite large. Um, this has resulted in the collection of over 13,000 catalog bags of artifacts. And those bags usually can contain multiple artifacts um, per bag. In the case of lithics, it's uh, sometimes hundreds of pieces. So, uh, easily 100,000 artifacts out of this site. Um, these artifacts range from pre-contact materials to historic materials, um, predominantly chipped lithics, um, and then also faunal remains, but it does span up into a historic period, uh, up into even like the 1920s. Um, there's historic glass, bottles, ceramics. I found a Chinese coin the other day, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, as part of the excavation, a uh, historic homestead foundation was identified. Um, and then also nearby, but not part of the main excavation block were talus pits with remains uh, that to my understanding have since been repatriated by the school. Um, to get a sense of the sort of occupational history of the site, there's sort of two things that we can look at. Um, as you can see, there is an extensive amount of radiocarbon dating that has happened at this site, um, almost entirely on bone. Uh, so we consider the occupational period to be generally in the Cayuse phase. Um, there's one outlier date, it's a charcoal date that is uh, about 4,800 um, years before present. Uh, and then we see seven dates in the like 2,000 to 1,000 range. And then the remaining 13 dates are within the last thousand years, um, really coming up into that uh, historic and arguably even modern period. Um, the stratigraphy at the site is a little bit messy. So um, some of these units are quite literally flipped. The oldest dates are at the top, the youngest dates are at the bottom. Um, and also, even though this is an extensive amount of dating, it's really only a portion of the site. This only represents, I believe, seven of the 20 or the 58 units that we see here. Um, another way to look at the time range is to look at the projectile point types. So um, extensive with the collection, over uh, quite a bit of student research, um, about 181 projectile points have been typed um, using the Carter key. Uh, and we can see that 168 of those are from uh, projectile point types that uh, span within the last 2000 years. Um, that's primarily Columbia corner notched B, Columbia stemmed, plateau side notched, and Wooloola rectangular stemmed. Um, there's another 11 points in the sort of 2000 to 7,000 year range, and that's Columbia Corner Notched A and Cold Spring Side Notched. Um, and then we have two sort of outliers, the Mock and Shouldered and Cascade series. Um, if Dr. McCutcheon wants to talk in and sort of jump in and talk about these, um, I'm not as familiar with uh, the projectile points that we would expect to see in this area or um, how reliable those two other uh, projectile points are. Yeah, the, I'll, I'll just add a little context, broader context. Um, uh, nearby, as the crow flies, where we've done some pretty extensive uh, probabilistic survey, systematic uh, pedestrian survey, um, this kind of profile for projectile points is pretty consistent for the uplands around the Columbia, Central Columbia River. A lot of recent points and then rare older points. The kinds that we got at the Grissom site are totally consistent with what we've seen elsewhere over much broader areas. Um, the radiocarbon date on charcoal, all the other dates are AMS dates on bone collagen. So we feel a little bit more confident in those. Um, uh, we've, you know, dated bones that were down low. They've had some older dates. Uh, and then we've also looked at some um, other dating uh, techniques, relative dating techniques. But as Nick pointed out, the stratigraphy, there really isn't much stratigraphy 
um, not even really soil horizons were really evident to the excavators back in the 60s and 70s. Um, and we haven't been really approached anybody other than the landowners to, they've had us come out and we've used some of that uh, more modern ground penetrating radar scans. Nick's been out there and done some of that survey trying to find those old historic foundations to figure out exactly where the excavation blocks were. There wasn't any permanent datum left at the site, unfortunately. So tying back into historic features is uh, a way to kind of reconstruct exactly where things were. Um, but there are some really old projectile points in the, in the collection. Those could be there just as a result of earlier use. Um, uh, but you know this, this is a pretty special place with an archeological record this size. It's not on a main stem permanent creek at this time. Um, uh, you know, things have trained, changed quite a bit hydrologically in this area, but it's, it's not on the Yakima or anything. So it's a pretty extensive site. And I think there is probably a pretty good connection to the ethnographically recorded site and the uh, area that was observed by um, some historic folks in the valley too, we'll mention here in a bit. Um, so Dr. McCutcheon, if you want to talk about uh, how we got to starting to uh, get to this sure. research, um, you've sure. overseen a lot of this. <laughs> yeah. So um, about 15 years ago or so, um, we started looking into uh, this, this site that the collection was still not yet appropriately cataloged um, and stored. Uh, and so my colleague, Dr. Pat Lubinsky, started working with students in 2005 to get the artifacts out of the grocery store vegetable bags with tags into uh, curation quality Ziploc bags with new acid-free tags and made sure the information is transferred correctly. And so once that happened and that information got put into a database, we were able to start querying the database and it just became apparent right away that this site was really special. And so one of the uh, uh, students I first did some significant research with, Ann Vassar, um, looked at five of the site, five of the excavation units there. Um, and we found, she was just looking at uh, the kind of technological classes that were represented um, as well as functional classes of chipped stone, as well as uh, collected some radiocarbon dates from AMS dates from bone. Um, during her work, she had a young undergraduate student working with her. And I, I checked in with that student at one point, Ann Parfit, and asked, so what are you finding? And she says, oh, it's kind of interesting. We've been finding um, some obsidian. And I said, obsidian, really? Um, how, how many pieces did you find? I was expecting her to say three or four. And she said, we have 37. And I was like, what? Uh, that's not the way sites in this area uh, have obsidian in them. And I was like, you must be wrong. It must be just black chert or something like that. So I went down to the lab and sure enough, um, they had piles of obsidian. And so we we started uh, keeping track of that with Vassar's research, but then Ann Parfit decided to do a feral scholarship and she started doing some uh, actual obsidian identification and chemical sourcing. And she added five additional units of the 58 now to a total of 20. Um, and they identified 167 pieces of obsidian and sourced came up with a sourcing protocol of which ones to choose, like all the bifaces got sourced, all the cores got sourced. Um, and we were getting pieces of obsidian good size that didn't look like the local tacolite, um, and it would have cortex on it. And it's just like, normally that obsidian that looks like it's coming from Oregon shows up as projectile points around the Columbia, this part of the Columbia Plateau. So something was really different here um, and kind of screwy, you know, in, in my thinking about what, how, what we should expect to find. So Parvitt's work revealed, um, I think about 10 sources uh, were represented 
at this particular site. And I started looking around the Pacific Northwest and I couldn't find another site that had 10 sources represented in it. Um, multiple sources for sure at some different sites. And I'd already been doing some obsidian sourcing in the Cascades at some sites around Mount Rainier where we had quite a bit of obsidian, but four or five, that was a high number of sources represented. So um, that that's the research that kind of keyed up uh, uh, Nick's research. Yeah, and then you emailed me at seven in the morning and said, hey, you wanna do a fair project? And I said, sure. Um, and so following up on that, um, really the question was to look at the rest of the site. Um, 20 units out of 58 is a, a small. about, I think about a third, yeah, small sample size. And so I was like, yeah, I'll do the rest of the site. Um, so I took on looking at the remaining 38 units that uh, Parfit and Vassar had not examined. And out of that, I pulled 114 uh, new pieces of volcanic glass and was able to have 59 of them sourced. Um, so just to give a sense of what some of the research questions were going into this, um, the biggest thing was trying to see if the patterns identified by Parfit were consistent across the rest of the site, if uh, getting a larger uh, look was going to maintain some of these initial um, findings. Um, this included uh, trying to understand how volcanic glass is being used in the site um, and within the lithic assemblage, especially how it compared to uh, the copious amounts of chert, copious amounts of chert. Um, some of these questions included uh, trying to understand if volcanic glass occurrence um, was related to source distance from the site. Um, this is a monotonic decay curve. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later. Um, and then one of the other questions is whether or not the presence of volcanic glass was related to trade, if it was uh, uh, symptomatic of the, the high rate of trade coming into the Kittitas Valley. Um, and we specifically wanted to look at uh, whether differences within the sources as they were represented in the site, um, we're going to be able to help answer these questions. So uh, just to give a sense of what the process was like doing this research, um, uh, since the rehabilitation of the collection, uh, everything had been cataloged and labeled and uh, stored in a Microsoft Access database, which I then queried. Um, and I painstakingly sorted about 2,200 catalog numbers uh, into a, a table so that I could go through box by box, unit by unit. Um, I really wanted to contribute to uh, the knowledge uh, of the collection. So I counted all of the chiplithics that I went through, not including any volcanic glass I removed and not including an organic material. Um, so I had a double redundant system. I was highlighting, was being very careful, methodical. Um, and we can sort of see a sample of that on the left. And then on the right is uh, my pile sorting. I sorted everything into piles of five to make sure that my counts were very accurate. Um, and this data actually became useful later and I'm gonna keep adding to that um, going into this quarter. So just to show you some of the volcanic glass looks like that we're talking about. Um, we have two sources represented here. The two on the left, um, that sort of really lovely olive green color are Douglas Creek tacolite. Um, those are one of the two sources that we consider local. I think it's about 40 linear miles away. Um, and then on the, sorry, sorry, that's my drawer. On the right, we have a finished biface uh, that was sourced to a source called Yakima that doesn't have a known geographic location um, at present. And you can see if you look closely at it, um, there's an incredible number of inclusions in this material. I'm honestly surprised they got a finished piece out of this. Um, all of these inclusions are actually voids that are filled with a crystalline structure growing in. Um, it looks like some sort of quartz material and they clearly interrupted uh, the way the material flaked. So, arguably not a very high quality material, and yet it's this beautiful finished uh, tool. Um, Parfit in her work did a lot more macroscopic analysis than I was able to do. So um, I pulled some pictures from uh, her publication with Dr. McCutcheon in 2017. Um, on the left, we can see this is the variability from one source, uh, Stray Gulch, which is uh, the most, the, the closest source, one of the two local ones. Um, I think it's about 12 linear miles away. Um, there's different inclusions uh, in the second one here. This has a texture that I ended up calling a sort of sugar texture. It's very grainy. Um, we see these really large sort of ring inclusions. 
Um, it's incredibly variable. And then looking at some of the other sources, um, in order, we have a projectile point that was sourced to Whitewater Ridge, um, a flake from Indian Creek. Uh, I think this is a biface from Bickleton Ridge and then another projectile point from Quartz Mountain. Um, so there's a good mixture of like that really classic, beautiful, like black obsidian um, and then much more colorful uh, tacolite, a good range of quality um, as well. Um, so to start looking at how the sort of objects break down. Um, I was able to identify or the sourcing identified two new sources as a part of this work. Um, looking at bifaces, there's not a lot, especially compared to like the 181 um, typed like chert uh, pieces that I mentioned earlier. Um, but we do see a, a couple from inc incredibly distant sources, including Timber Butte in Idaho. Um, Cores tell a different story. The most cores are from the two uh, closest sources, Stray Gulch and Douglas Creek. Um, Stray Gulch predominates, and they're not very big cores, um, but they are definitely cores. Um, interestingly though, flakes yet are a different story. Uh, Douglas Creek has quite a great deal of flakes, as well as Bickleton Ridge and Indian Creek um, from Southern Washington and, and Oregon. Um, and then very few chunks, basically no shatter um, represented at all. So looking next at sort of the reduction sequence, um, looking at uh, how this material is coming into the site, whether it's being flaked off of a, a raw cobble or refined um, flake or a tool blank. Um, Stray Gulch and Douglas Creek again show a lot of initial reduction, which is maybe what we would expect, they're local sources. Um, and that initial reduction really falls off uh, the further the sources get with again, Timber Butte being a little bit of an outlier. Um, intermediate reduction uh, is a little bit different. Again, we see a lot from Douglas Creek, not at all from Stray Gulch. And then again, from one of those, uh, those more distant sources. Um, and then looking at terminal flakes, it, very, very few at all. Um, and quite a bit of the sample, I think more than half, couldn't be assigned a reduction sequence at all because they were broken flakes or because they were not flakes at all. Um, so to give a sense of the geographic spread that is coming into this site, um, this is a map of all of the uh, known sources identified in the Grissom site. And uh, uh, the symbols are scaled by the uh, number of artifacts from each source that were found in the Grissom site. So we can see Stray Gulch and Douglas Creek, those two local sites. Um, Douglas Creek is really well represented here. And then we can see the further south we go, it does start to drop off. Um, but again, Bickleton Ridge, Indian Creek and Timber Butte here are all still fairly well represented um, in the Grissom site. Uh, and we'll sort of uh, come back to this in a minute. So it's important to understand that there are actually two ways to consider this data. One is by artifact count and one is by weight. Um, and sort of an interesting thing shows up when you consider either one. So Parfit only had one piece of uh, Douglas Creek tacklite identified and my sourcing results uh, added another 30 pieces to that, which makes Douglas Creek tacklite the most prominent source by count. Um, and then Stray Gulch tacklite, I didn't get any pieces of that. And it's actually ranked fourth in terms of count with those two farther sources, uh, Indian Creek and Bickleton Ridge um, ranked two and three, which is not quite what we would expect. Um, hypothetically, the farther a source is from the site, the um, less likely it is to be represented in the site because of the energy it takes to move that material there. Um, if we go by weight, however, we arrive at a slightly different picture. Stray Gulch predominates. Um, it has the most by aggregate weight. So despite having almost half as many pieces as Douglas Creek, those pieces are clearly much bigger, um, which sort of reflects what we saw that some of them are much earlier in the reduction stage. Um, Douglas Creek still at the top of the pack and then Bickleton Ridge and Indian Creek. So we really see that those four sources are the most represented in the site, no matter which way we slice it. Um, and two of those are quite distant sources. I think they're, one of them is about 200 miles away. Um, so to get a little bit more focused in, look at what it looks like within the site itself, 
Um, so this is a map of the excavation units. Um, it'll look a little bit clearer in a minute here. Um, these symbols are scaled by the amount of non-volcanic glass lithic artifacts in each unit. So these largest uh, triangles here represent 2,700 to about 3,300 pieces um, within a unit, uh, going all the way down to oh, one piece, a couple pieces here and there. And then they're color coded by the percent of uh, volcanic glass within those units. And so right away we can see areas of intensification um, where there's clearly a lot of tool production happening. Um, and compared to that, the rates of obsidian or the percentages of obsidian are sort of away from those areas where a lot of that tool production is happening. Um, these areas that are white circles are the units that Parfit did. Um, she completely understandably did not count all of the chart uh, material that she went through. And that's what I'm gonna start working on. Um, so this data is a little incomplete. I'm gonna work on filling it out. Um, on the right here, we just have a zoomed in version of what that looks like. These purple triangles are, I believe nine and 11% um, volcanic glass respectively, um, versus over here, it's like less than a 10th of a percent. Um, so to get a better sense and a sort of more complete set of data, um, these two maps are demonstrating uh, the, on the left, the amount of obsidian that is coming out of each unit. So right away, there's some areas where there's a ton of obsidian. Uh, this unit M0E, this is one of the ones that Parfit searched, yielded 44 pieces um, just out of one unit. Uh, we see a couple others, JTW, R0E, Q3E, um, having sort of higher counts. And they're still in those areas that are distinct from the really high counts of, of church hypolithics. Um, Moving over to the right, uh, this is showing the number of unique sources represented within each unit. So again, the same units are lighting up, M0E, Q3E, R0E, are really showing that there is a diversity of obsidian in these places. Um, and it's starting to get a picture that maybe obsidian is being processed in a different place in the site, um, uh, being used in a different way that is uh, distinct from the other chipolithic material. So then looking at where uh, really our top two sources are, our two local sources. Um, on the right, we have Douglas Creek Tacolite. So um, we can see it's got a pretty good spread across these units. Um, there's four pieces out of the ITW unit. Um, Q3E is again, a little bit of a hot spot. Um, and it sort of makes sense with all of those pieces, uh, the 31 pieces that we get out of the site. By comparison, Stray Gulch is very constrained. Um, it's showing up again in JTW, M0E. Um, both of these are looking fairly distinct from those areas of intensification, but the Stray Gulch more so than the Douglas Creek. Um, and so that sort of considering the relationship of the weight to the constraints of where it is in the site and the limited number of pieces, seems like its use is a lot more like specific within the site. Um, a lot less general than some of the other uh, obsidian and certainly the uh, non-volcanic glass um, chip lithics. So to get some of the other findings from this work, um, I identified two new sources since Parfit, that was Coyote Wells East in Oregon and then the Yakima source that doesn't presently have a known location. Um, I also had that piece of unknown tacolite that I hope to try to source to see if a, another sourcing lab can identify where it's from. Um, we saw that dramatic shift in the source frequencies and aggregate rates, and this really validates that it was important to look at the entire site, that the sample was not going to be representative of what the site really had to offer. Um, that shift toward the Douglas Creek was especially interesting, the fact that there was no new stray gulch. And this helps us get into uh, testing the monotonic decay curve. So um, this is looking at uh, that concept that I talked about earlier, that the farther the source is from the site, uh, the less it's represented within the site. Um, in their publication in 2017, uh, Parfit and Dr. McCutcheon ran a Sturman's rank correlation test um, that basically is testing this relationship, um, both on the artifact counts by source and on the aggregate weight by source. And the test failed to identify a relationship um, between those two variables when using count. 
but when using weight, it identified a, a moderate negative relationship. So what we were expecting, the farther away it is, the less that we see. With the new data that uh, I was able to add to this, um, we can reject the hypothesis in both regards and uh, especially by weight, that monotonic decay is strengthened. We see a really strong correlation um, between source distance and source representation in the site. Um, and then in terms of where we're gonna go from here, so this is actually the site that I'm gonna keep working on for my thesis. Um, I'm gonna be looking again at the relationship between Grissom and Shayla Han and the obsidian as a way to help uh, start looking at that. Um, so Shayla Han, this ethnographically recorded uh, site um, was recorded by uh, Alexander Ross, um, who's an explorer in like the mid 18th century, um, and then recorded again up into uh, the early 20th century. Um, and this has been sort of investigated before, but the um, amount of research on this site, while it is large, uh, has not been um, synthesized uh, very much. Um, Holly Shea in her 2012 thesis was able to put some of this together and I'm going to keep going in that direction. So one of the first steps is going to be filling that data gap, um, counting all of the uh, chip lithics from those other units that Parfit looked at so that we can get a better sense of uh, the entire site and where tool production is happening. Um, doing the debitage counts, I'm going to try to do aggregate analysis on those largest units like ITW um, and probably some of the units of interest. Um, I'm going to do a random sample of the sort of chipped technology to see how it is corresponding to what the volcanic glass is saying. Um, and then if possible, I want to see if there's non-local chert in this site, if the chert is following the same patterns of trade and movement that the obsidian is. Um, this is going to involve a queer theory approach to investigating uh, the sort of variation within the lithics. Um, a little bit of comparative presence absence for other archaeological materials to place the lithics in context. Um, and then looking at a geographic analysis of the site as it relates to other places. Um, this is clearly a very unique and important site just in the early work that's been done. And I think it would be especially helpful and enlightening to be able to use the obsidian sourcing, some of that presence absence analysis to look at how the Grissom site is connecting geographically in this larger uh, context on this landscape and the people that are coming to this place and using it. Um, ultimately, the question is like, why here? Why this place? Why Kittitas Valley? Why the Grissom site? Um, and how can we really assess through the archeological assemblage why it is this place? Um, Dr. McCushion, do you have anything to add? Thanks, Nick. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the the that it's a great place to kind of uh, end the future research. Why here? Why this place? Alexander Ross came over in 1814, uh, working for the Pacific Fur Company, looking for horses, and he knew there was a great. He called it the Grand Rendezvous in the Kittitas Valley, and uh, knew that he was taking some chances going there. His description of that encampment was uh, you could see uh, fires, um, campfires for six miles in every direction. There were thousands of uh, males there as well as women and children. Um, and, and, and I think he said three times that uh, in horses. And uh, while his narrative is cert was published in the mid 1800s as kind of a Victorian era travel narrative, a lot of, if you look at Ross's accounts of when he got on a ship on the East Coast and came around the South America and up and you compare his narrative to other people's first hand, first account narratives, they, they match up pretty good. And so I think there was a lot of factual information in what Ross was saying about this gathering. Um, the uh, Yakima uh, members that we, community members that we work with, um, you know, have let us know they've known forever that this is a really important place. Um, we have uh, one of their archaeologists that is working with us, and it's going to be on Nick's uh, thesis committee. So we're really looking for some uh, important input uh, into uh, 
kind of building a, a, a joint uh, indigenous narrative uh, for this location. So it, it, it matches really well with uh, your acknowledgement statement that uh, Dr. Kaiser made tonight. And uh, I think it's really important to look at these places as Im important places um, on the landscape. And it's not just because of what they have in their archeological record. Um, we would never get to do an excavation of this scale uh, today. So making the most out of this collection uh, is really an important thing, especially since it's been sitting in boxes for so long. So we're, we're trying to make good on that. And um, I think it's, it's important to think about the Kittitas Valley, you know, from that original map, I told Nick, leave those highways on there because it shows that the Kittitas Valley is a crossroads today. I think it's always been a crossroads. Uh, if you look at the GLO Indian Trail maps, um, there's, you know, tons of them that come down into the valley. So th this was a meeting place, but it's, it's not the only meeting place as the Swaggerty map showed. Um, you know, the Dalles was a meeting place. There was Tillamook was a meeting place. And there's a lot of obsidian diversity in those places. And so um, as one Native American told me recently, it's, you know, it's not the black shiny rock. That wasn't the value that was coming in to the location. It was the people that were bringing that rock that was the value that they were bringing their observations, their views, their oral traditions, um, and their backgrounds and their perspectives. That's, that's what's valuable. Um, and so I, I, I think there's a lot of ways that we are not taught in graduate school and in, ed, in, in higher ed to think about the archeological record that we're, we're finally getting turned on to. Um, and so the Grissom site is a really great place for us to take a look at that. Yeah. Um, well, that's all I have. Um, I have the resources cited here if anyone actually wants a closer look at some of these publications, um, but otherwise I'm open for questions. Well, thank you very much. That was that was fantastic. I um, am very curious to know how the obsidian and chert match up. Very curious. Um, Same. Uh, yeah. Right. Oh, <laughs> so exciting. Um, so to the chat line, we had two come in, and uh, the first person was wanting to ask again about the lab. Which lab did the obsidian sourcing? Uh, so that's the Northwest Research Obsidian Studies Laboratory. Um, I was specifically in communication with Alex Myers. Um, very kind. He actually took a couple pieces that were typically considered too small for chemical sourcing. So in the selection process, um, there are actually a great number of pieces that I couldn't include because they were just too small. Um, and actually part of the in future investigations, I want to see if it's possible to get some of those pieces sourced just to get more sourcing data because clearly there's more to learn. Yes. All right, and the second question that came through is, in Oregon, we're very used to seeing obsidian lithics all over. Is this a much more rare occurrence in many parts of Washington, particularly central and eastern Washington? Yeah, I can, I can answer that. It is much more rare. We do have sources of um, rhyolitic obsidian as well as the tacolite. Um, but uh, they, they're very discreet, most of them, and uh, they are often not what one would call high quality. Um, there hasn't been any mechanical analysis of obsidian in Washington, um, but as you could see from some of the pictures, they're not free from inclusions, and um, they often occur in very small pieces and uh, the artifacts that are made out of now, we have projectile points made out of local material, um, local obsidian material, but uh, in central Washington in particular, we have chert or petrified wood or petrified bog, um, whatever you call it, everywhere. It mm -hmm. is not a problem coming up with some chert and thus, we have artifacts, chipstone artifacts everywhere. 
Um, and so it's, you can't walk long without walking into a lithic scatter around here, but the black, shiny rock dig out. And um, while we do have it, and when we do source it, it is usually most of the time, in my experience, until the Grissom site, I'd say 90% of the time it's from Oregon. Okay. All right, and uh, another, the other question that came through is, was agate or other uh, rocks used for stone tools or lithics? Yeah, there's a, a carnelian agate that occurs outcrops not too far from the Kittitas Valley up in the hills. Um, and then there's other sources of agate in the Cascades as well. And those do show up. Um, occasionally as projectile points. I've never seen flakes, but I've seen projectile points um, made out of that material, a current ag. It's beautiful red translucent uh, material. Yeah, um, from my perspective, in terms of what I've seen going through, I think at last count, it was about 34,000 uh, flakes. Oh, nice. um, there's actually, so there's quite a bit of that petrified wood material um, and flakes of that petrified wood. Um, I can't say I recall seeing a lot of like specifically agate. Um, there's a lot of like that sort of um, uh, chemical accumulation style chart that looks very fluid and is sort of semi-translucent or else the um, bog style stuff. And let's see. And another uh, from Dave is, do you have any idea for the time frame for the various sources? That's a great question. Um, time is really hard to control for in this site because of the stratigraphy. Um, so there's actually, uh, we didn't touch on it as much, but um, Daniel Burris uh, is a student who uh, used some of the pieces that Parfit identified and did obsidian uh, rim hydration testing on those. Um, which works as sort of a relative mark of age, um, but couldn't assign like actual date ranges. It's really more like this piece is older than this piece, but it's not like a, this piece is 2000 years old. Um, in order to do that, we would have to be able to reliably associate those obsidian pieces with bone pieces that could be dated or existing dates um, from bone which is really difficult to do. And that's gonna be sort of part of my thesis project is looking at um, taking a closer look at how much we can control for that stratigraphy in order to get some dates uh, to be able to look at whether or not the presence of uh, different sources changes over time. But presently that data is really hard to work with and access. We, that's, we really would like that data um, very Love much it. so. But uh, from Burris's work, there were two interesting results. One was there was kind of two populate, it looked like maybe if, you know, the samples were drawn from two different thicknesses of hydration rim. They were pretty, pretty close to each other and far, far enough different. And those roughly lined up stratigraphically so that the thicker rims were on pieces that were further down in the stratigraphy, the thinner rims were generally on pieces that were closer to the surface. Um, but the, the tacolite, which is what we have the most of, which is where you could actually build possibly an interesting hydration um, uh, chronology, unfortunately is opaque. And so you cannot do hydration rim analysis mm. on it, which is just like, our um, yeah. Yeah, frustrating. <laughs> yep. Very Deeply frustrating. so. Oh, um, and also, are you able to kind of clarify a little bit more as to why the stratigraphy there is such a mess? Uh, in the immediate term, um, it's agricultural land that is uh, cattle grazing. Um, so. Uh, in the site report, I think there was an understanding that the site had been plowed at least once since it had been excavated, almost certainly plowed before it had been excavated. Um, and in the present tense, uh, that's grazing uh, territory that gets turned up by cattle for a good portion of the year before they get moved off of that land. Um, 
usually in the early fall and that's when we were able to go with the GPR and start trying to investigate uh, re-identifying where the invest the original excavation uh, might have been. Um, I think there might also be some other geological processes at play, um, but that's something that I have to get to as part of my thesis research, um, one of the several moving parts. Yeah, there's uh, abundant evidence of uh, small rodent bones in the site, yep. which doesn't mean that those are necessarily natural, but um, a lot of evidence of burrowing animals and in some of the deepest excavation units, there were historic glass towards the bottom. So those are probably going down rodent mm -hmm. burrows. Um, and so, or crotovenas as we call them in archeology. span um, so, and then potentially some uh, frost heave too in the valley. We get quite cold over here in Eastern Washington and there's a, a good freeze melt period in the spring and some somewhat in the fall too. So lots of ways for stratigraphy to get um, kind of erased. Uh, the excavation you may have heard of, of the uh, Weenus Mammoth uh, by my colleague, Dr. Pat Lebinsky, uh, down the river a ways, uh, to more towards Yakima, next valley south. Um, the stratigraphy there was the, the same, and uh, they had a lot of evidence for cicada burrows as well. So um, lot, lots of ground disturbing critters living in our, our uh, uh, calcium rich soils here. All right, fantastic. Um, yeah, so it looks like it looks like we had our last question self serve. They did a little Google search and got their own oh. <laughs> own answer. So, um, yeah. So, unless anyone else has a question, I would I would like to thank you very much. This was fantastic, and I uh, we need a follow up, right? There's so many open ended questions. Well, there, right now there is, and and um, you know I'm just the luckiest professor in the world to have Nick to work with, and. Uh, feel really excited about what we might discover. And I'm so happy that uh, John Schellenberger from the Yakima have, have joined us. And uh, we're really excited about what we're gonna, we're gonna generate out of this work. Many good things. So. Yeah. Oh. All right. Well, thank you everyone. And we will see you next month on the second Tuesday of the month. And all right, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Patrick.